So their model was you need to get a handle on your Bible and then you're going to go to the university and your primary role at the university is to be an evangelist and to be a light into the darkness. Hi, I'm Brandon Briscoe, and welcome to another episode of The Postscript, Living Faith Bible Institute's weekly podcast and YouTube series devoted to interviewing pastors and professors from LFBI and across the Living Faith Fellowship. On The Postscript, we love discussing missions. Uh, we love talking about men and women who've chosen to leave what they know in order to go to other places in the world and introduce people to the gospel and the message of Jesus Christ. We love to discuss that. In fact, it's probably the underpinning of every single interview that we do uh, on this show. Sometimes, though, we like to get together and have very overt conversations about missions, about missionaries, telling stories of the unknown and forgotten missionaries uh, and missions movements is often very, very inspiring for people, but also it provides us with a lot of really great practical insight about how to do missions work and how to engage with people from, from different cultures or, or learn lessons that are necessary to being as effective as possible in the way in which we live the Great Commission. Today, we are going to be discussing the late medieval group uh, referred to as the Waldensians. And, and so if you've listened to church history podcasts with us in the past with Pastor Greg Axe, uh, this would be a name that you might be familiar with. Uh, this is a group of people that originated in Italy, and they preached the gospel fearlessly in a time where forms of Christianity that broke from the Catholic tradition were frowned upon, and, and these were a persecuted people. And for this conversation, I have invited my dear friend, uh, Pastor James Fife, former missionary to Southeast Asia and professor of missiology in the Living Faith Bible Institute to talk about the Waldensians and provide us with some insight into um, the way in which they ministered and, uh, and help us to be inspired by some of the things that they lived and did. And so, James, welcome to the show, man. Good morning. It's good to have you here. It's good to be back. That, uh, that hoodie you're wearing is very vibrant. Yes. This is from Kenya. Mm. Yeah, I saw it in the market and loved it and thought it also felt very bright and Kenyan. Yeah, without being for sure. maybe overwhelmingly Kenyan. There's kind of a, a mixture now in, in, in modern day Nairobi of like the bright colors thrown on to more modern apparel. Subdued by the Western kind of visual sentiments. Toss it on a hoodie, make it mostly gray. Yeah. Throw in the, the Kenyan pattern or Kenyan yeah. color. Yeah, well, it looks really nice. Um, how, how, like how are it. things going in Nairobi? Really good. Yeah, yeah we're really encouraged. For people who aren't familiar with, with that work, maybe just talk about what's going on in Nairobi with the hope of planting a living faith church. In, in yeah, Nairobi. absolutely. Uh, so Jeanette Bachage came to Kansas City, spent about 20 years here. Gra graduate of LFBI. Graduate of UMKC, came for school, then a graduate of LFBI, mm -hmm. then went back to her home country of Kenya with a handle on her Bible and a desire to engage in a church. Couldn't find a church in Nairobi uh, that was like-minded. Started having Bible study with her family members and coworkers. And out of that grew, you know, at times 20 or 30 people who would show up for Bible study. Sam started jumping online yeah, once pa a pastor month. Pastor Sam Miles, president of LFBI, pastor at Midtown Baptist. Good, good yeah. clarification. Yeah. yeah. A little bit of... I have to do that, man. I know, just toss to the names out here like it's just you it's and okay. me. Yeah, There's no, no, people are listening. People listening. Don't know. Yeah. Uh, Sam would jump on and do a you know an occasional uh, Q and A Bible study, and people were loving it. And you know, out of it, you know, it just started growing. Last summer, Miles Cheadle led a, a missions trip there. About fifteen of us went, and I and my family stayed for a month and a half, and uh, kind of laid the foundations for what is now uh, a small church. Uh, a number of young men and women have been discipled. I had the opportunity to disciple two men who are now also discipling other men and uh, are growing. So Ken is one of these guys. He is actually in Foundations 2 mm -hmm. currently in LFBI and with plans to jump right into Foundations 3 and keep going. Is They're working on starting Creation to Christ Bible Studies, and they have uh, an open door through Sebastian, another one of the, the, the young men there. He's on the, the university campus there. Mm -hmm. 
at uh, University of Nairobi, which on that campus, I think has about 60,000 students, but he's president of uh, a student union of some, some sort of student, Christian student club. Anyway, it's a big deal. He's got an open door. They've invited uh, our people to come and, and to preach to them uh, mm. regularly. Yeah, Not only invited, but they're willing to pay for people to come yeah. and to preach to them. So a great open door on the university and uh, that, that small group of of young believers are taking ownership. They're making a plan for how to approach that, and they want to uh, get on the campus regularly to share the gospel. It's a, It really is a work of the Lord. Mm -hmm. um, it's an incredible thing. Um, if people can think about it, uh, it comes to mind. Please pray for yeah. uh, a man of God to rise up um, in our ranks or in the, the ranks there in Nairobi to... Mm -hmm to take over the work and to pastor it and to lead it, shepherd it. And it's in need of a shepherd. And right. so we need prayer in that yeah. regard. Yeah, it is a bit of an interesting work because we don't have a pastor or a key man there. Mm -hmm. You know, it started with a, a Lydia type situation, a woman just inviting people and, and investing in those around her. So they're desperate for a pastor and maybe God, as you said, raises it up from among them or from among us or the, the broader us. Yeah. I don't know, but please pray. Yeah, and, and so I, I like having that conversation to segue into the one that mm -hmm. we're having on the show because there is so much work um, in Nairobi right now that actually looks akin to some of the things that we actually see in the Waldensians. Um, right. And so I can't wait to, to talk about that. Uh, give us some insight. Just start by giving us some insight into the origins of the Waldensians that were, were known originally as the Poor Men of Lion. Tell us about that group. Yeah, sure. They had a few names, the Poor Men of Lion, the People of the Valley. Um, spellings vary, as mm -hmm. anything does from that time period, the Waldenses or the Waldensians or the Valenses. So originally, uh, they were in the Italian Alps. And, and give us the time frame before we get too far. Time frame it will run from roughly 1100 to 1500. Okay. So we'll hit kind of a few different highlights throughout Throughout that so time mid period. mid Middle Ages yeah to early Renaissance right yeah okay mm -hmm. yep um, so you know a lot of people will trace their origin to a man named Peter Waldo he lived 1140 it's about 1205 uh, a Christian man born into means but then decided to sell all of his earthly goods and committed his life to preaching mm -hmm. so it took a little bit uh, of as many did, actually, at that time. This was not an uncommon position. He took, a, but a little bit of an extreme position from where we sit today. Right. To, you know, to reject all, all of the means that we might even say that, that God had given him and blessed him with ahead of time uh, through his family and to take a life of, you know, poverty and to, to believe that the Bible and holiness, righteous living were more important than the, the things of this world. Yeah. And that kind of ascetic uh, 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 approach to ministry life was not entirely uncommon uh, in that time frame, mm -hmm. especially. But uh, from his perspective, it was necessary in order to contrast against what he saw as uh, maybe maybe the overabundance of the Catholic Church mm -hmm. and um, the the wealth of the leaders within within the Catholic mm -hmm. Church. Yeah, exactly. And, and that's why it was not uncommon for Christians at this time. Actually, well, for some, it wasn't uncommon even in the Catholic Church. You have guys mm -hmm. like Ignatius right. who had These are monastic and, lifestyles. Though. And gave it up for a very strict monastic lifestyle in hopes that suffering on this earth would translate into eternal uh, glory of some sort, right. you know, directly because yeah, this I was, don't eat or I whip myself. Right, or, which is not what we see here. This no. isn't This isn't a form of penance. Um, no. That it's not that kind of, of asceticism. It is much more just the conviction that if we're gonna if I'm gonna live missionally, then I better not have a whole lot of ties mm -hmm. to, to this world. And in fact, many missionaries and Christians mm -hmm. even today do that out of, out of uh, conviction to be more free to obey the Lord. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and you get biblical example and insight into this, the mm -hmm. idea of being pilgrims and strangers, of being sojourners, of, of not being deeply tied and rooted in this world are, are biblical principles. As you mentioned, so for Waldo, it was uh, observing the opulence of, you know, especially the higher-ups in, in, the, in the Catholic Church. 
that left such a bad taste in his mouth and many others that said, Mm -hmm. this is not actually what Christianity looks like, Mm -hmm. right? Christianity should not be getting rich on the backs of of the common people. Uh, You know, the the priest or the clergy class shouldn't want even exist. And and if so, then why are you getting rich off everybody Mm -hmm. else? So he gave up all his riches in a, a, you know, maybe a a small, a small protest, maybe a bit of a, of, of a protester. Uh, um, but to say, hey, look, I have, I have God, I have Christ, and that's enough. Yeah, and this became a cultural element of the people that would follow. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. So the people that would follow him um, took that same type of approach. So in very little in terms of worldly possessions, and not prioritizing worldly possessions uh, from the very beginning. And you know, as as we'll get into, I think that actually may have helped them quite a bit with the persecution that they would face. And, you know, they already had a willingness to give up everything. Mm-hmm. That would be put to the test in in the most difficult of ways for many of them mm-hmm. uh, down the road. Yeah, But, uh, you know, some even would trace their origin further back, as far back even as to Vigilantis in the 4th century. Um, so, uh, you know, a quick look at Vigilantis. He, um, in short, was hated by Jerome. Mm. Right, so Jerome wrote a, a whole book called, entitled "Against Vigilantis," and the reason was because <laughs> Vigilantis, um, well, was against everything that the Catholic Church stood for, everything mm-hmm. that Jerome stood for, specifically mm-hmm. the Latin Vulgate. Uh, Vigilantis believed that every person should have the Bible in their own language, and that the Latin Vulgate was not it. Uh, was against uh, relics, was against the the deification or the sainthood of, mm-hmm. of any per- individual person, the elevation of man. You know, basically all of the the Catholic right. principles, which is early on. In the, I mean, the Catholic Church at that point sounds oh, like yeah. it was only around a hundred years or so at the point that he started condemning it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. This he was born in roughly three forty, mm-hmm. three fifty, somewhere in there. It's yeah. hard to know yeah. exactly. Wow. Yeah. Opposed to the, I mean, when we talk about the um, Jerome's Latin Vulgate, mm-hmm. you know, I think for uh, for those of us who are, are Bible students and familiar with manuscript evidence, w- we understand. That there's there's aberrance in the in the translation the Latin translation that mm-hmm. Vulgate um, created, but maybe explain a little bit to us why that tradition of of despising the Latin Vulgate is important to our view of preservation. Yeah, so that's a great topic, and to cover it, you're going to need to jump into Alan's class. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. you're going to get you're going to get uh, eight weeks of of Alan coming at you 90 miles an hour. To, For sure. To cover it, but essentially, you know, you, you trace the Bible back to two core texts, two core lines of scripture. One that, that came out of uh, Alexandria and into Rome and one that came out of uh, Antioch, mm-hmm. right? And so you had men like Origen who influenced men like Jerome. Uh, they not only worked on textual translation and textual criticism, but they took an approach to texts, especially Origen influenced, you know, everybody after him. To look at scripture as primarily uh, allegorical, mm-hmm. that you should not take scripture literally, which allowed them to take as much liberty as you want. If everything yeah. is an allegory and you have no standard or means of interpreting the allegory, then you can make anything mean anything you want. Right. And so back to our topic today, the Latin Vulgate was critical in terms of establishing what would what would become Catholic dogma mm-hmm. and tradition um, and, and the manipulation of of the divine text to achieve the um, ends that the Catholic Church desired. Yeah, so from the Roman perspective, that was the only Bible that was allowed. Mm-hmm. You know, they worked to, to get rid of all other Bibles. It was, you know, mandatory reading of the Latin scriptures alone. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So we, we can see um, that these poor men of Lyon um, mm-hmm. may have actually found their lineage almost 600, 700 years earlier in Vigilantis. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yep. Cool. Yeah, which is a cool thing, you know, and, and you saw early, especially really early first century Christians doing the same thing, tracing their lineage back to to the apostles and to Christ, and they had a handle on that that, that we don't. I mean, mm-hmm. I think it'd be a pretty cool thing if I could trace my discipleship lineage right. all the way back to, uh, yeah. you know, to Christ. Yeah. I mean, the, the record keeping is so poor mm-hmm. uh, and so dispersed and so much of it of... of what was written was written by the Catholics in charge. There's so much revisionist history taking place. It mm-hmm. really is difficult for us to, to find any sort of uh, 
uh, line, direct lines uh, mm-hmm. back to the first century. But the beautiful thing is that it's not important. What we do see, and Alan Shelby in, in a previous episode discussed this, a bubbling up throughout history where right. you you have moments, surges in biblical literalists taking God at mm-hmm. his word, living missionally, uh, devoted in faith to the to, to God's word. And so you see these moments in history and we can say, oh, we look kind of like those guys. And I right. think this is one of those those peoples. Yeah, absolutely. God has always had a, a remnant. God has always had people throughout history. There's never been a time on this planet where he didn't have people who held to a true word and you know lived it truly. And maybe mm-hmm. they didn't look exactly like we do in every in every area, um, which I think would be the case of the Waldenses. Mm-hmm. But held, you know, in terms of core doctrines, we're willing to stand against and and side with certain core doctrines that distinguish them from the majority. Yeah, and that was tough. Yeah. So, so in terms of uh, Waldo, he really was the the one that kind of formalized though mm-hmm. uh, what would be known as as a Waldensian tradition. Right. Peter Waldo, I mean, really was an interesting man. And he did really uh, proclaim uh, some very serious things about what what they believe. They established some things. Uh, Can you tell us a little bit about what the Waldenses believed? Yeah. And this will sound a lot like us. They believed in the atoning death and justifying righteousness of Christ. So Christ died to pay for our sins. And that's the only way that we can get uh, right with the Lord. They believed in the Trinity the Godhead, they believed in the fall of man and that all men are sinners. They believed in the incarnation, the bodily incarnation of of God and you know, as Jesus Christ. Mm-hmm. They denied purgatory. They said that it it was an invention of Antichrist. Yeah. You know, they said some pretty strong things. That the value of, of voluntary poverty was big to them, as we mentioned earlier. Mm-hmm. Uh, they believed in the universal priesthood of the believer. So that every everyone who is saved, you know, is 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 equal in terms of the priesthood. Uh, so they spoke against the elevation of the clergy class. They spoke against the the hierarchy of the universal church. They spoke yeah. against the pope. Yeah, the, the common man had access to God the same way any clergyman does. Yeah, 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 absolutely. But they were also just you know just as well known. For what they disagreed with, right? Yeah. Um, in fact, that's the thing that probably got them in, in hot water is what they spoke out against in terms of Catholic doctrine. So maybe tell us some of the things that they that they rejected. They rejected uh, the relics. So they they believed that dead men were dead men. Their bones had no significance. That that nothing should be regarded as special or holy. They rejected the pilgrimage, and they mm-hmm. they thought that that served only to waste one's money. You know, so they. You know, believed in the poverty anyway, mm-hmm. so they were pretty frugal. Uh, but they believed, yeah, yeah. So they rejected the pilgrimage to to Rome or to Jerusalem or to any other place. Uh, they rejected the fact that flesh might be eaten. Uh, you know, in, in the the transubstantiation in, yeah. in in the Eucharist. Now, early on, they held to the Eucharist. They did, um, but over time, um, they were informed by more of the the, the early reformers mm-hmm. and some of the things that were being taught. And they changed their position on it to be a more biblical one. They did. Yeah, I thought that was really interesting. Yeah, that was one of the the errors that they held on to for quite some time. Mm-hmm. That wasn't enough to keep them on the good side of the Catholic Church because everything else that they spoke out oh, right. against, for it, sure, it just the list went on and on. They believed that there was no such thing as holy water; that water was water, and that it mm-hmm. would not, you know, save. That the baptism of babies uh, was of no value. Yeah, um, they practiced uh, immersion. Baptism mm-hmm. themselves only for only for people who um, were converts declared their belief in Christ. Correct. Yep. And prayer. They believe that prayer was just effectual if offered in church or in a barn, mm-hmm. which you know worked out because they were driven from cities and towns and churches and spent most of their time in caves and in hiding places. And they knew that God heard them mm-hmm. and that they had again direct access to God. Uh, yeah, and and um, also. Which is is was probably got in the um, crawl of the Catholic Church. They believed that the papal order was the seat of Antichrist, which is a tradition that many Baptists still hold to today. <laughs> so yeah. they're one of those early uh, adopters of the idea that that 
the papal throne was yeah. actually the seat of, of Antichrist. Yeah, they they referred to it as uh, the harlot of the apocalypse. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the papal throne. So early, early references to things that, yeah, we still, like you said, hold to, well, a lot of us. Now, now there were people that wrote uh, in this time frame uh, about the Waldensians. Uh, mm -hmm. what, what were some of the things that were that were said. I mean, they were lumped in with other heretics of the time. But what were what was the Catholic Church saying in mm -hmm. terms of their record of of who these folks were? So Peter Waldo died in 1205. Officially in 1215, the Catholic Church declared the Waldensians as heretics. Mm. So it didn't take long, right? Ten years after his death, this group is already being declared as heretics, and and they're lumped in with anybody who disagreed with them. Yeah. And so, because Rome was powerful, because Rome, uh, you know, would also had a large military, they could go in and they could destroy any writings, any records that that they didn't agree with. Mm -hmm. So they had the power, and I think you mentioned this already, to to write history the way they wanted to. Yeah. So a lot of what we'll read about them and some other groups of from that same time period uh, are written from the perspective of you know uh, Pope Innocent the Third, um, who was who was ruling at that time, and the popes that followed mm -hmm. and his people. So it's a, a you know a, when they're declared a heretic, well, but that's from a heretic's position, <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah, for sure. So heresy is, you know, is, any, is essentially any, anyone who doesn't agree with my truth. Right. It's so. relative to your doctrinal set. Right. Yeah. And so we're going to get into the, the persecution here in a moment, but I think what's really important, and again, reminds me kind of what's happened in Nairobi, or even just the ministry model that we hold to in a lot of our Living Faith Fellowship churches, um, in what ways were the Waldenses uh, missional? Like, you know, this is, we're talking about unknown missionaries. Yeah. And uh, if people aren't familiar with this group of people, I think it's important to see in what ways were they living out the Great Commission, mm -hmm. furthering the gospel in the world. I mean, obviously they had some longevity. Um, and so what was it that they were doing that expanded the cause of Christ? Mm -hmm. Before I answer that, I do think this is an interesting point too that you mm -hmm. just kind of brought up. You know, other than Peter Waldo, we don't actually know the names of hardly any of these people, mm -hmm. though they you know, primarily stretch a 400-year period of history. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of people have heard of the Waldenses, you know, as a group or as a movement. They're they're not really technically an unknown. Yeah, it's uh, kind of like the Moravians or yeah, other movements like exactly. that. Exactly. Yeah. So it's a it's a larger group, a larger movement, and you, when you span 400 years, uh, you know, that's that's a lot of time. Mm -hmm. You know the reason they lasted 400 years because of was because of their missional values. Mm -hmm. So they started as the people of the valley. They lived in the valleys of the Alps, and they, their belief was that that everybody could read the Bible, everybody could access the Lord in prayer, and everybody had the responsibility uh, to evangelize. And so mm -hmm. they began to teach uh, and train in evangelism and scripture. As they they were persecuted, they were driven out of the valleys and up into the higher mountains. Uh, but they kept the same mindset that said uh, that Scripture is the foundation for life. So they all would copy Scripture by hand. They would write mm -hmm. their own copies of the Bible, and often many times over, so that they had multiple copies, because yeah. they had a practice of of giving out Scripture. It was against the law to deliver the Scripture that they had, because it wasn't the Vulgate. Mm -hmm. uh, so they would they would take pages, a few pages of scripture and sew them into the hems of their garments. To transport them. To transport them undercover. And whenever they would engage somebody in conversation that seemed like they were wanting to hear truth, they would they would then un, you know unsew that and pull the scripture out and give them portions of scripture. You know, mm. maybe maybe just a few pages of John or maybe a few pages of Romans. But they had the entire Bible in their language and they were writing it continually. They were training people to go uh, and to be evangelist. Now, specifically, they believed very highly in two things. Um, one was that the lay the layperson could be an evangelist. So, they sent craftsmen, artisans, uh, tradespeople out to go intentionally into the workforce. Not just in in Italy. They moved over into Leon, France, and then actually they they were sending people all over that region. You know, the, into modern day. Spain, England, Czech Republic, uh, you know Luxembourg, just mm. all over that area to go into work. Yeah, 
and they told him that you're going to work and to do whatever your job is, but your primary role is actually to be an evangelist. So that was one side of their uh, approach to putting lay people onto the mission field. Mm. The other side kind of co- corresponded with another big movement that was happening at that time, and that was the the, the birth of the university. Mm-hmm. So in France around that time, universities are growing and they recognized right away that this was a, a, a mission field. Yeah. One of the earliest, um, you know, campus ministries and, and ministry models came from the Waldenses. Mm-hmm. So they were intentional about, memor- again, memorizing scripture, transporting scripture with you, and then taking young people, first equipping them with the scripture, and then sending them to the university. First priority was to be an evangelist and to be a light. In fact, uh, you know, one of the things that is, was often said about this people uh, in Italian, it was lux lucet in tenebris, which mm-hmm. means a light out of the darkness, mm. right? And so they were known as being this light in the darkness. So, you know, that would go into their persecution, but also the university. They recognized that the university system as a whole, even at that time, was not equipping people to follow the Lord. Yeah. In fact, was contrary. It was teaching you know, uh, Origen and Aristotle's method of approaching yeah. life. Yeah. It was St. Saint Thomas Aquinas, Aristotelian logic, mm-hmm. humanities, yep. um, drenched in the Catholic Church. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So their model was you need to get a handle on your Bible, and then you're going to go to the university. And your mm-hmm. primary role at the university is to be an evangelist and to be a light into the darkness. So they saw the university as a, a dark place. Mm-hmm. And then you'll also get a, you know, a degree, be a good student uh, and, and succeed there. So those two things are what drove their, their missions endeavor. And I think that's what kept them you know, reproducing for hundreds of years is that they were reaching the common man and they were reaching the university student, yeah. which had the potential to become you know, anything right. in the society. S- S- Sebastian didn't know that he had ties to Peter Waldo. In the right. Lindsay's. You know, yeah. he's, do, he's doing his thing on college campuses, and, mm-hmm. and uh, little did he, did he know that this is not revolutionary. <laughs> no, this is a Waldensian ministry that's yeah. been going on for a thousand years. Yeah, it's pretty cool. It is super cool. But also, one of the things that we see is that as they were training up these preachers, uh, they were sending them into villages to meet secretly in people's homes. Mm-hmm. They were doing home Bible study evangelism. Mm-hmm. Uh, long before we were ever talking about it at Mission Focus and at these conferences, they were doing, they were going into people's homes. They were staying for short periods of time mm-hmm. and they would invest the word of God, disciple and evangelize um, in, in kind of a secret, hidden uh, environment. Yeah, absolutely. So they had, you know, um, what's, what's the like the circuit writing ministry yeah, yeah, type yeah. of a pulpit yeah. filling ministry. You know, mm-hmm. we've done that in mm-hmm. our history at the church that we came from. Yeah. We don't have the opportunity. Well, we still do it here. We still you know, do it from time to time. Yeah, a, when a an opportunity bit. pops yeah. up. Um, but they had that same type of idea. Yeah, they would establish places where they could meet and they would go and they would both evangelize and use those as, as churches. Mm-hmm. And a great way to train preachers, right? Like right. they refer to these as uh, these men as barbas. But so these were guys that were running around preaching the gospel, um, starting Bible studies, mm-hmm. expanding the kingdom, expanding mm-hmm. the work, and and more people were coming to um, to follow in this tradition. Mm-hmm. And the Catholic Church uh, got more and more upset about this. So this time period it overlaps uh, many of the Crusades. You know, many of the multi- multiple Crusades that took place uh, during the Middle Ages. We, we know that the Crusades were a military movement mm-hmm. intended and, and motivated by power and expansion of the Roman Catholic Church. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's what the Crusades were about. But then also there was the Inquisition that t- was taking place simultaneously with the Crusades, and the Inquisition was about rooting out heresy wh- mm-hmm. wherever they could. And so the Catholic Church was rounding up anyone that disagreed with them Maybe you can tell us about the oppression of the Waldenses and the approach that the Catholic Church took to to uh, suppressing and oppressing this people group. Yeah, so you know, up until probably about twelve hundred, the in order to to get all the rewards of crusade, 
you had to travel to Palestine, you had to travel, you know, to Syria, Israel, that area. Mm -hmm. It was about win back the Holy Land, right? Mm -hmm. So, so that was tough. You know, it's a long journey. Yeah. If you're a soldier, it was very dangerous. But in early 1200, uh, Pope Innocent, who, by the way, has the wrong name. Yeah, right. Anything but. Greg Axe often talks about that. About that guy? Yeah. And about that name? Yeah, any pope named Innocent generally wasn't that, wasn't that innocent. Yeah. So, well, so Pope Innocent said, hey, these are small groups. The, you know, the Waldensians, for example, relatively small, especially compared to the size of the, the, the Catholic Church at the time. But he recognized that if I allow them to grow, that they're going to be a problem. So I got to get rid of all the heretics. Mm -hmm. And so he um, offered a very, very appealing, um, you know, crusade option. You don't have, no longer have to go all the way to Palestine. You can be a crusader right here in a France. Crusa a crusade of convenience. A crusade of convenience to yeah. help us eliminate the heretics. Okay. And so the offer was for just 40 days of service, if you go from, you know, they're located typically in Lyon, which is more kind of northern France. If you head just to southern France, and, you know, there were other groups as well at the same time, like the Albigenses. Uh, who were targeted, the Waldenses. If you go to southern France, or you just head into the, the French Alps, and uh, any any heretic that you find and kill, you're entitled to claim their land. Mm -hmm. uh, you can take all of their wealth, and and the blood that you shed will wipe away all of your former sins. And should you, by chance, die on the mission, you will get immediate entrance into heaven. Well, and then you would also imagine what type of character is going to take this up. These are the ones who have the you know probably the most blood on their hands and the most most likely think I have no chance at getting into heaven. Oh, all I got to go do is kill a few people and all my blood is wiped away. Like this is mm. good. So, you know, these mm. these are some some unsavory characters yeah. to put it lightly. Yeah. Uh and so that's what uh began these these inquisitions. And so the, you know, Soldiers were sent all over that region, all over the Alps, all over southern France, and they are just uh, finding anybody who disagrees with the, the teachings of the Catholic Church mm -hmm. and are eliminating them. Hey, thank you so much for listening to the show. We're going to pause right here for just a second so we can hear from one of our students from the Living Faith Bible Institute. Hi, my name is John Scott. I go to Northside Baptist Church in Columbus, Ohio, and I'm an LFBI student. LFBI is spectacular. It's an institute that is taught by pastors as opposed to professors, people who are actually in the ministry with their feet on the ground, in the dirt, making disciples, evangelizing, and actually loving people. And it's the best resource out there for any sort of Bible teaching. In my life, I've used many of the classes. One in particular is the evangelism class. After going through the course, I was able to transform by God's grace the whole method and the and the whole process of the Bible study where it is more evangelistic and we're able to actually reach out to people and then actually study the Bible together. It's something so simple, but man, it's it's because of LFBI that that changed. Now now we're able to plug that into an evangelistic ministry that we have out of our church. So I couldn't recommend LFBI more. To enroll for classes, visit lfbi.org. To support LFBI, please visit lfbi.org slash support. In 1211, more than 80 Waldensians were burned as heretics at Strasbourg. Mm -hmm. This is often attributed as kind of the launch into this, uh, this persecution mm -hmm. of the Waldensies. Yeah. These men of ill repute were, were getting it done. And so, so that moment actually is recorded that it was almost enough to kind of wipe out the movement that mm -hmm. it, that it that it did squelch the fire for a moment but then it started to burn it started to burn brighter and then mm -hmm. the persecution had to ramp up in response yeah and in that time period 1211 it, it was a tough time i'm, I'm going to reference another group that were not as much like mm -hmm. the albigenses mm -hmm. but just as an example of the brutality of the catholic church and of those people uh, of those soldiers so in 1209, they had a, a, a crusade against the Albigenses. Mm. The Albigenses ended up retreating into uh, the city of uh, Beziers, France. Mm. 
And along the way, during the retreat, a number of the, cru- of the, of the Catholic crusaders got into the city as well. So one of the captains calls up to the, the, the papal legate and says, hey, there's a lot of our people in the city. There's a lot of the, the heretics in the city as well. What should we do? And the response was, kill them all. God knows those that are his. And so they went in, and in that day, they, they eliminated an entire city. Not a soul escaped, according to the, the man who, who carried out the action. He, he himself wrote that they killed 20,000 people, mm. burned every house to the ground. Other historians estimate there were potentially as many as 60,000 people in the city that day. And so they just wiped in, walked in and wiped everything out. And this was the approach. Uh, and and it, it wasn't really any different for the Waldenses either. Right. Um, maybe tell us about the massacre of Marindol. Um, this, was, this was later in time. This is, you know, quite a few years have, have passed mm-hmm. but, uh, at this point. But just in order to frame the level of persecution, um, maybe explain that, that story. Yeah, so this actually is uh, in 1500s, you know, mm-hmm. 300 years have passed, but this is how, how determined, one, the Catholic Church was to root out their, what they called heresy, and two, how persistent in the face of continual persecution God's people were, mm. and how the truth continued to flourish even against incredibly overwhelming odds. So the massacre of Marindol happened outside of Piedmont, uh, the Waldenses joined the local Protestant churches, and after uh, they com- they'd integrated themselves in some of the other local mm-hmm. churches. Okay, mm-hmm. yeah. yeah. So they're coming out of seclusion, um, but the French King Francis I on January first, fifteen forty five, uh, issued the Arrêt de Merindol, uh, which is simply was a was a declaration that uh, again all all of the heretics needed to be rooted out. And so uh, January 1st, 1545, they take an army in into this area, uh, Mar- Marindol, just outside mm-hmm. of Piedmont, mm-hmm. and they, they kill thousands in, in a single day, uh, se- several hundred to potentially seven, several thousands in a number of different villages kind of in that area. Just a devastating work, just like you described with the Albigenses. Yeah. Just devastating, like go in and annihilate, you know, because... The, again, it, it, these are crusades of convenience, and so y- you can't spot visually what a Waldensian looks like. Yeah. What, what a Waldensian looks like, you can't tell by the way that they they present themselves, and so it's just it's a matter. Of, well, okay, we'll just wipe everybody out. Yeah, let's just go in and massacre everyone. Um, and this kind of behavior continues even into um, man sixteen fifty five. I mean, we're talking about yeah. uh, century after century after century of oppression. And then there's this event called the Piedmont, Piedmont mm-hmm. Easter, mm-hmm. which it is one of the most terrifying and terrible stories mm-hmm. you can imagine. So maybe tell us about this. Give us the uh, PG-13 version of, of what happened. Yeah, if you were to Google Waldenses and click over to images, you're going to get... Some gruesome, gruesome stuff. Yeah, if you look up the Piedmont Easter, you're going to see drawings and, and you know and reproductions of of some awful stuff. January of 1655, the Duke of Savoy commanded the Waldensians to attend mass or remove to the upper valleys uh, of their homelands. He gave them 20 days to make it their decision. Right. So January in the Alps, it's the middle of winter. Mm. The command is attend mass or forfeit everything you own and retreat to the high Alps. Mm -hmm. Most of them said, we will not attend mass. And so in January, in snow through, uh, you know, freezing rivers, every one of them from children to elderly uh, hiked out and up into the upper Alps. And, you know, they found up there the remnants of prior generations of of Waldenses who had been forced to do the same thing. They were Mm -hmm. welcomed warmly. They're taken into the homes, but that wasn't enough for uh, the Duke of Savoy to just drive them out and have their lands. They followed them up into the the upper mountains as well and and attacked. And it was, again, it was was spare no one. Uh, When you read the accounts that uh, it, 
there there is there are is every form of wicked torture and mutilation imaginable and unimaginable yeah you know they're 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 taking babies from mothers and just smashing them to death they they are raping killing dismembering yeah yeah it's 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 the worst of the worst of the worst that you can possibly imagine yeah and if you don't have the stomach for it um just take us at our word it, it, it yeah, it's bad don't look it up and um and and these were these were innocent people mm -hmm. these were people who you know again it, it reminds us of the the fox's book of martyrs and the mm -hmm. stories there the accounts there um these are as you know hebrews refers to this is a these are people that the world was unworthy of mm -hmm. and so you know um it's incredible you know it's always um very sobering to think about what christians have gone through and uh, and are going going through even right now in the mm -hmm. world and in, in, in many places and people who are, who are just like us in terms of beliefs mm -hmm. you know the things that we would stand and comfortably declare on any Sunday in any one of our churches uh, in terms of core doctrines or, you know, the the preservation of scripture or the priesthood of believers and, you know, all of those things. Th that's why they were being killed. And it's sobering and challenging. Um, and we would like to think that that doesn't happen or won't happen in the current world, but that would be that would be a, an unreal position, as you mm. mentioned. We know that that is happening around the world. Um, places where I used to personally live and work and, and, and just other places around the world, places where we have missionaries, same things are happening. Mm. You know, we get reports from India all the time, Pakistan yeah. all the time, just other parts of the world where these same things are happening for the same reasons. Um, and maybe the, the face of the persecutor has changed a little bit. Um, you could do a whole nother episode on the, on the interesting correlations between perhaps the Catholic Church and you know, the, the Muslim movement mm -hmm. to eliminate heresies as well. But mm -hmm. that's a whole nother conversation. Yeah, yeah. Um, but this is what believers who really truly believe in the cause of Christ um, are willing to endure. And mm -hmm. I think that's the thing that we need to remember is that is that what wouldn't you give up, you know, what wouldn't you give up to um, to follow Jesus and to declare His truth, and uh, and so it's a really good reminder of of how valuable our faith really is. I think it's important, you know, in these episodes we always kind of talk about the legacy, mm -hmm. the legacy of of a people group. Or, or a missionary, you know, what they've done. How's it, how's it impact us today? What, what has it actually done to impact us in the way that we approach uh, missions and ministry today? Uh, in the 16th century, you know, the, the Waldensians were eventually absorbed into the, the Protestant movement and uh, became influenced by Calvinism. And, and so they kind of mm -hmm. got uh, enveloped into that kind of theological position as well. Uh, many of the Waldensians that exist today um, are categorized in the camp of like Methodists. Mm -hmm. In fact, there's there are um, organizations that lump them together, um, and uh, they become probably more liberal in their theology. Mm -hmm. um, you, you would have a hard time, you know, recognizing the similarities between what they've become today. This is what happens with every great movement. We, you know, it, it, it eventually becomes a a, a distant memory yeah. of what they did. But but outside of their recent evolution, tell us about their historic legacy and what they've meant to the world. Yeah. Yeah, I think we see it as was maybe alluded to, we'll just say it more plainly now, exactly what's happening in, in Kenya uh, on the campus uh, or here. You know, I, I teach, I actually teach nursing at a Catholic university here mm -hmm. um, for, a, for a nursing program. And there's a Bible study on that university. Um, young men from, from your ministry mm -hmm. hold a Bible study there that you know started with just a couple guys 
uh, praying together. And now it was 15 or 20 guys that are meeting together. Yep. And um, they, I would, I would have the same view that the Waldenses did, that their job is to be a light in the darkness. Mm -hmm. And the darkness is that Catholic university. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't have to be a Catholic university. It's convenient that that one just happens to be, but it could right. be at any state university, at any university. We have, you know, between big and small, we've got five or seven universities within a couple miles of us. Mm -hmm. And we have Bible studies going on in a, on a lot of those campuses. And that is, uh, you know, that's that's the legacy, one of the legacies of the Waldenses is that we see the value of being intentional about not only what we choose for our education, but seeing our, our educational process as an opportunity to share the gospel. Yeah. And so we go intentionally into the campuses uh, as students and even myself. You know, I, I do work at this university, but I see this as primarily a mission field right. uh, and an opportunity to take light into the darkness. So I, yeah. have, I have voice with hundreds of students and dozens of faculty yeah. in, a, in an institution that, you know, at, at some level favors religious conversation. Mm -hmm. They start out with the position that they're open to it. Yeah. And I think, I think that's one of the things that we talk about a lot um, in the fellowship is, you know, key cities, you know, we have this conversation about key cities, lots of the key cities that a lot of our church planters are going to mm -hmm. are places where there are universities mm -hmm. and students, because these are people who are establishing their identity forever. Mm -hmm. And they are open, they are malleable, they are interested, they are um, open to debate, they're open to argumentation, they are not as uh, uh, reticent. And that's worth taking advantage of in terms of love and affection mm -hmm. and so, like understanding the value of souls and the mission. It's, it's worth seeing that for what it is and going to those places knowing that there will be opportunity to to talk about Christ. Yeah. And and so, you know, that's what we're seeing here with with the Waldenses, but also we're we're emphasizing that in our ministries as a whole across the fellowship. Yeah. I think you also see in terms of legacy, uh, you know, their willingness to send just the common man out mm -hmm. to to preach uh, and to get involved as well. I think you see that reproduced and it's not unique to us, but in a lot of churches across the country where, where we say, hey, everybody should get a handle on Scripture. Yeah. Everybody should be memorizing Scripture. Mm -hmm. They wrote it by hand, but you should be reading it. Maybe you should write it. Maybe that's a good practice. Mm -hmm. Memorize it, uh, learn the Scripture, and then get out uh, and teach it as well. So I think you know that's a big part of our ministry, yeah. uh, reaching families, reaching you know the working class, um, another aspect of what they've passed on to us as well. Mm -hmm. What about their approach to scripture? I mean, you, you made reference to that, but I think it goes, it goes sure. fairly deep. They're, they're often re times referred to the Waldenses and even the Albigenses and others of that time as kind of proto-reformers. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's been said that if these groups weren't so heavily persecuted and nearly eliminated, that the Reformation would have started in the 12th century instead of the 16th mm -hmm. and would have been based in France instead of Germany. So... Mm. You know, they, they had that hold on scripture. And so I think a couple of things comes out of that. Number one, um, we see that legacy in, in our view of scripture, and we still see similar persecution against scripture. You recently sat down with Mike Reno mm -hmm. as an example of someone being directly persecuted, a people being persecuted because of their hold on, on scripture. Um, but I think there's an encouragement as well, and it's, it's scriptural. You know, it's the same type of it thing that you heard about John the Baptist. This guy does not look like, act like he's not necessarily what you expect out of a prophet, mm -hmm. meaning what what the people of that time expected of a prophet. He's not wearing soft clothes and and sitting in a fancy place and getting all the the, the adoration of men. Right. This guy's just rough and tough and different, and that's who the Waldenses were. And I think that's an important challenge and reminder for us too, and maybe especially even at that college age where there's so much pressure to conform to the image of the world mm. and to be just what someone else expects you to be and to fit these molds and to say, well, you know what? John the Baptist didn't, and Jesus didn't, and the Waldenses didn't. And, you know, and that, you know, that line of person who would stand up 
and, and speak against the the authorities, speak against the mainstream. You know, there are other names that we've brought up, but all the way down to here, yeah, where we're saying that I, as an individual, can don't have to be maybe what common, you know, broad broad brush Christianity says we should be or what somebody else from the outside, what the university says, that we should all get along, that we should spiritualize instead right. of instead of take hard stances on on different ideologies. So mm-hmm. be unique. Yeah. Be peculiar. Yeah, don't don't focus on the material world. Um, mm-hmm. and again, not not for the sake of asceticism or a monastic lifestyle, but just recognize that the world is corrupt and fleeting and that there's a spiritual investment worth making. And the you know, first Corinthians reminds us that um, our investment needs to be in eternal things. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, big deal, um, man. Really interesting, really interesting study here. Lot that we didn't cover, right? In in their story, mm-hmm. but one that has a huge um, impact on who we are. Uh, and I really like what you were saying at the beginning of the episode when we when we discussed that we, you know we're talking about a people group here. These are unknown the names we know Peter Waldo. There might be a few other important names throughout the movement um, that we could make reference to. to um, mm-hmm. But at the end of the day, these were just people obeying the Lord, and we don't need to know their names. Right, um, Christ does. Yep, Christ knows them. Mm-hmm. We offer mi- uh, missions courses yes. here at the Living Faith Bible Institute. Mm-hmm. Uh, you are um, a missiology professor. You're experienced in missions. Mm-hmm. You've done missions almost your whole adult life. It's your heartbeat. Uh, you go on missions trips like 100 million times a year. Um, you're obsessed with it. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the course load that we teach? Just walk us through real quick. Mm-hmm. What are we doing in our missions courses and why are they worth people who are interested in the work of missions, why are they worth taking? Yeah. So we start with introductory to missions. Everybody should take. It's a a 16-week course. It's going to give you the foundational understanding, uh, a biblical framework Mm -hmm. and perspective on missions. Uh, Biblically, a a small look into historically, culturally, uh, you know, practically, just talking about uh, all that the Bible says about mission, the mission, missions, and missionaries. So that's where it starts. Um, again, that's something that everybody needs. Yeah. From there, it's Missions One, uh, which is a focus on mission support. Both, uh, it's kind of a two-sided coin there. So how do we as a, a local church support missions? Or how do you as a missionary get the support you need? So it's, a, it's designed to go beyond the financial component. Mm-hmm. Everyone thinks about missionaries needing to raise support. And you go, uh, missionaries and money. All they need is money. No, they need a whole lot of other things. Yeah. And if we don't support them well, uh, you know, then then we're going to end up with more problems than 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 we very need. true, very true. That one is coming up in about two weeks. Actually, that will start here. Uh, it's an eight week course, so it's at the second half of the semester. Mm-hmm. Missions two is a focus on actually the things that we were just talking about. So it talks about um, movements and influences uh, on Christian missions throughout history. Yeah, and so we'll talk about movements like. You know the Waldensians, or maybe the, the the Reformation, or you know the Inquisition, those types of things. So it's yeah. a, a walk through history, and up into the modern day. What are the things that are moving missions now, and how did all of those historical things actually impact us now? Yeah, Prin- so, and principles that affect that, right? It's not just right. a history class. These no. are principles that, exactly. that you can take. Yeah. yeah, it's not a history class. Greg does really good history classes. Mm-hmm. We're not trying to rebuild that. This is what do we pull out of that, and how do we principally live according to that? Yeah. And then we have uh, a, a missions class that's focused on church planting. So it gets more into kind of the details and the weeds of, of you know, that specific facet of what do we do when we land in a different place and we start trying to plant a church. Mm-hmm. And then we have a missions practicum as well. So getting you on a mission field, having somebody oversee uh, your your time and, and growth as a, as a short-term missionary. Yeah. Yeah, really good. We're really beginning to develop that missions program aspect of what we do, and and I think you've done it. You and Chris Best have both done a great job uh, of developing that material, and so we want to encourage people to take those courses. Yeah, but absolutely. James, man, thank you. My th- pleasure. Th- thanks for hanging out. These are always fun episodes. I love digging into this stuff, and uh, a lot of our a lot of our listeners really appreciate, it, especially the missionaries. So thank you for for doing this. Yes, sir. Yeah.
And we want to thank you for joining us for another episode of The Postscript, another Unknown Missionaries episode. We hope that it was enjoyable, that it was fun, um, but also sobering and an opportunity to learn for yourself, to be inspired to do uh, whatever the Lord asks you to do in terms of his mission. We do want to equip you. And so if you are a member of a local church, talk to your pastor about learning more about missions uh, and uh, visit lfbi.org. You can learn more about our missions classes as well as the whole of our program. And we want to invite you to come join us uh, to go deeper and to learn about ministry leadership and maybe uh, more and more about um, theology and what the Bible says about our lives. But we're grateful for you. We're always grateful for the time that we get to spend with you on this show. Uh, I love it. I love you. Um, I just got back from a conference recently, and so many people uh, are listening to the show um, that are talking about it and uh, find value in it, which is the most important thing. We want it to strengthen and edify you in your faith. And so it's such an encouragement to me. Please continue to write reviews, subscribe to to the show on all the different platforms, um, share things as you have conviction to do so. But we're really grateful for your listenership, and we do love you. Anything you need, please reach out. Uh, But with all of that said, uh, we hope to see you again next week for another episode of The Postscript. God bless. Thanks for listening to The Postscript. If you enjoy the show, please leave us a rating and review in order to help other people find our podcast. If you value this show, please help us continue creating content by supporting Living Faith Bible Institute at lfbi.org support.